Well, we're still in the middle of the too early, aren't we? No, that's possible. Okay. Good morning for those of you that are here, and also good morning for those of you that are at home. I would remind you that today is uh, Holy Communion in this season of Lent. So if you have not, uh, please prepare uh, some uh, juice and a piece of bread, and we will celebrate Holy Communion uh, together at the end of the service. Uh, are there any other announcements that we needed to make? If not, then we once again are glad that you're with us, and we hope that today's service will be one filled with joy and be one filled with God's word in his presence. Is everybody's mic on? Just checking. Is mine on? Yeah. This morning's praise medley had some familiar songs, Holy, Holy, Holy. It's communion, and we always like to sing Holy, Holy, Holy on communion Sunday. And the middle song is not familiar, but easily sung. And then our last song, Let Us Break Bread Together. We, of course, will know that, so please raise your voices and join in. Yeah. 
On our prayer list this morning, we want to remember, is it Jock's son? Is that how you say the name? Jody. Jody, okay. Who wrote this? <laughs> Can't read my wife's writing. I guess that's why I don't get my honeydew list done a lot of times, is because, <clears throat> sorry honey, I can't read your writing, <laughs> is having uh, major surgery tomorrow, so we want to remember uh, him. Also, uh, uh, my cousin Phil Caldwell is uh, having some of the same problems that I had with uh, heart. Uh, must run in the family. So uh, get well, and it sounds like that you're in good hands, and uh, the Lord bless you and your bride. Uh, also, Louisa Vanquez is still out sick, and we pray for her. I think I just got a message from her that... Uh, she misses us. Uh, Lee and Becky Brown request prayers for Dennis Gunning. Uh, Candy Schwartz's sister, Tina Piers. And we want to lift up Tim Wilder. And uh, also uh, Doc Marcel, Bill Aderman, and Tyler Peden. Any others that we need to lift up? Before my uh, corporate prayer... I would like to uh, start with the uh, 130th Psalm, and then I will go straight into a time of corporate prayer. Listen to these words from the psalmist David. Out of the depth have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let us pray. 
O oh God, our presence this morning represents, we pray and we hope, our love and our devotion to your righteousness and to your holiness, to your sovereignty. And as we enter this morning by your invitation to this most holy of holy tables, we do remember your birth. We do remember your life, but we also remember your death upon the cross. But we move from that moment of sorrow and grief to one of joy in remembering that after that, your resurrection. In this, our hope and trust in an eternal life gives us confidence gives us courage, gives us commitment, our calling, our character, our charity, our cheerfulness, our church, our citizenship, our cleansing, our comfort, our confession, our consecration, our constriction, and most of all, Calvary, where all of our sins have been washed by the spilling of your blood. So, O oh Lord, it is with this confidence of faith that we lift up those who are sick, have special needs, spoken and unspoken, those that are grieving, those that have sorrow and pain, and for those that have weakness of mind. We ask for your eternal healing in all of these. Protect those who are protecting us. We pray for all of the Christian pastors and their congregations throughout the world, for we know that for the most part we remain safe and secure, that there are those pastors and churches who have put their life on the line and many are suffering the consequences. We pray for them, O oh Lord. On this day of Holy Communion, we pray that you would spiritually unite us. You would bless us, bless us through our obedience to you. You would guide us, and you would continue to show us the way to and through the cross. For it is in your name that we do pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Thank you. 
Amen, and thank you. I'm reminded that I forgot one for our prayer list, and that is one of our uh, choir members, Dana, uh, who is still out sick, so we want to remember to lift her up. I'm excited about today, today being communion. The scripture that I will begin with is from the New Testament, the book of St. Luke, the 22nd chapter beginning with verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread. We could look at that word unleavened and preach on it for at least an hour and a half with the symbolism and the, uh, the meaning behind it. But the day when nothing was present, but the day of the Lord and our communion with the Lord, nothing extra added unleavened, the bread that the Israelites had to eat going across the desert. But I better move on or I won't <laughs> stop there. <laughs> <laughs> then came the day of the unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. You see, the Passover had already been instituted and, and Jesus had uh, already celebrated this through his upbringing and through his life because this was something that the Jews, the Israelites, had been celebrating since the first Passover, which we will look at in just a few moments. And they said unto them, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall be a man that will meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. Now just think about that for a minute. They're saying, where do we go? What are we going to do? What kind of preparations we're going to make? And Jesus said to Peter and John, Just start walking down the street. Now that took an act of faith right there. Sooner or later, you're going to come upon a man and you're going to know it's the right man because he's going to be holding a pitcher of water in his hand. That will be your first sign. And you shall say unto the goodman of that house, the house, the master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? See, Jesus is talking through Peter and John here, and giving a quote that this man knows who Peter and John are. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, and there make ready. And they went and found as, they had, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you, before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof. This is the Last Supper until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. 
For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also uh, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. We come gathered together here today in this local congregation as well as you are sitting at home. We come this day not only to praise the Lord and to sing psalms and to hear the word of God, but we come this day to observe and celebrate and participate in the Holy Supper with Christ. For me, in my very simplistic mind and an easy way to explain what communion is, for me, communion is the presence of the Lord. In my studies, there have been, and I'm sure there's more, but today I will lift up three seasons and times that the call of God has been made clear to his followers to remember his commands and also to remember his grace. Down through the ages and into the future, we identify this solemn time of what our church calls Holy Communion, but we also hear it called the Lord's Supper and the Eucharist. Each nomenclature places a different emphasis upon the service that we're celebrating, but there is one main theme that validates all, and that is communion is not only the presence of the Lord, but it is, a, it is a time to hear and to listen, to obey, and to commune. For this message, I would have you to remember three outstanding times of communion, of the Eucharist, of the Lord's Supper, times that we can listen to God and follow Him. The first is the very first Passover, the very first time of communion and it comes to us from the book of Ex Exodus the 12th chapter and listen to this as God begins to commune with his people through a time of Passover and explaining what the word Passover itself means for I will pass this is God for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. That means that all the firstborn of those in Egypt are going to die. Both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses which ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, what's God telling the people of Israel? He's saying there's going to be some bad things happening tonight. You just think that you've seen bad. But it's going to be horrible. In order for you to escape this horrible, terrific thing that's going to happen in just a few minutes, I want you to take the blood of the lamb and I want you to go outside and right where you have your ring thing you know where you can see people that are coming to your house I want you to take that and I want you to take the blood of the lamb and I want you to put it over the top of your front door and when the angel of death flies over he will see the blood of the lamb and he will protect you, and he will not enter into your house with the angel of death. 
I will pass over you. Passover. That's where the word comes from and where the celebration comes from. A time that death passes over us. A time that the blood of the Lamb protects us. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You see, way back in the book of Exodus, God is telling us that through communion and through the blood of the Lamb comes our salvation, and that we should begin to honor and observe this from now on. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord. That's what we're doing today, and that's what you're doing at home. Throughout your generations, from this time way back in Exodus to this very day on this Sunday, ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. That's the first communion, the first Passover. And then we just read the second one with Jesus sitting down with his disciples. The third one that I think is to mention will be at the marriage feast right before the millennium, right after the rapture, and we'll talk about that. The emphasis is not so much on the, on the elements of bread and wine, and even though in the book of Exodus, and we don't have time to go into it right now, but God even tells them to prepare meat and to get ready and exactly how to set the table. The emphasis is not on the bread and wine, but it's upon holy communion with our holy God. That is, remember me. Today, when I partake of the elements of bread and wine, one of the thoughts that's going to be going through my mind are those people way back in the book of Exodus when they were given the message to take the blood of the lamb and to put it on the top of their door and they would be protected. We need protection. Our faith needs protection. Our country needs protection. Never like it has before. As much, if not more, than these people back in Exodus. God says to remember me. And Jesus says to remember me. Did he think we would forget? We can't even forget him historically. He's there. What Jesus is really saying is, remember I was with you at the beginning of this world. Jesus is saying that I knew you before you were conceived in your mother's womb. Wow. I was prophesied by the priests, the kings, and the prophets. I was introduced as the Christ by John the Baptist. Remember me. Remember that I lived a sinless life. Remember me. Remember that I offered myself as the only acceptable sacrifice for the expiation of sin, extinguishment. Remember that for you and me after my death, my burial, there was a resurrection. And I returned to the Father, and now remember what I told you. Remember that I am preparing a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm preparing this place for those who have believed and who have followed me in this life. Remember me and use this occasion as a supper to remind yourself of not only who you are, but whose you are. Suppers have been used forever to celebrate an important and monumental event in, in our lives and in the lives of others. There is the tradition of the last meal on death row, and there traditionally the man or the woman about to be executed is given the last privilege of being able to have one along beside that condemned person 
and I don't know if it's true at this moment, but it used to be where they always supplied a chaplain, and the chaplain was there right next to the condemned and walked with the condemned right up to the gas chamber or the electric chair or to be injected with that deathly fluid. And he was there for a reason. He was there to give that condemned person one last chance to repent and to make their life right and to remember that Jesus died for their sins and that there's forgiveness for everyone and anyone, no matter what they've done. Sometimes a special meal is, is used to mark a graduation or maybe a milestone in life, a promotion at work, an anniversary, an engagement to be married. Jesus was telling his disciples, this is it. This is the last time you're going to see me in this form. I will be meeting with you as I'm heading back now. I'm heading back home to be with my father. In Florida, we are celebrating our season of pollen. Everything around us is green, not from being envious or jealous, but from the pollen from the trees. Jesus was telling his disciples, this is it. This is the last time in this form that you're going to see me. While I was at uh, Emory University going through the course of study for my ordination, I had the uh, honor of being class president of my class. And after many years of blood, sweat, and tears, one of my duties as class president was to arrange a final dinner. And I was to invite a special speaker. And I was to monitor and coordinate all the processes to make sure all happened with, without a flaw. Much like Peter and John were doing in preparing that upper room. It was a time of celebration. We were finally graduating. But at the same time, it was kind of a bittersweet. It was going to be joyous because no more tests, no more hitting the books, no more study, no more burning up I-95 and 75 going back and forth to Atlanta. We could just now get down to what we had been called to do be in the pastorate. At the same time, it was kind of bitter because over those many years, things had happened. We had developed friendships, relationships. We had had experiences. We had pulled jokes on each other. Some were mean, some were funny. <laughs> But if you pulled a joke on somebody, you knew they were going to pull one on you, and it was just a matter of time. And in that last, that last dinner, that last supper that we had, it was bittersweet. For 99% of those men and women I graduated with, I've never laid eyes on again. We separated. But I know I know that I will see them again and it will be at the Last Supper. It was the same with Jesus. His work was finished, but now he must die for the sins of humanity. Our memories aid us in remembering what is important, what is priority, and what is reality when someone contracts cancer. I know it's horrific when someone has a physical ailment or disease. But I think in mine, this is just my opinion, that when Alzheimer's senility or dementia hits somebody, it is sad because it affects not only that person, but everyone around them. When we remove our memories, 
this becomes one of the greatest dangers in our society and in our faith. In our faith, if we forget to remember what Christ has done for us, if we forget that first Passover, in our country, if we forget those that felt it important enough to lay down their lives to establish a country and freedom and exercise of worship, there will be no traditions left. The monuments will be torn down. Names will be erased and deleted because of maybe a small character flaw, maybe a difference of opinion. That is cancel culture. I call it cancer culture. The past is erased. No traditions, no liturgy, no history, no foundation to build on. The progressive movement is not progressive, it's regressive. In George Orwell's book, 1984, and I've quoted from him before, a great prophet of our country, made this statement, and I quote, He who controls the past controls the future, and he who controls the future controls the past. Boy, how true that is. Let me erase the history and I can control your movements presently. This last week, all of us learned that uh, Dr. Seuss has now become an anti-hero in our land. His books are being banned and not being carried by many book distributors. But yet at the same time, Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kemp, continues to be on the selling list, and you can order it. The name's on the OK list. I remember and watched it with my own eyes and heard it with my own ears when the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, read Dr. Seuss to a group of grade child and grade uh, school children. What happened? What happened between the time that Michelle Obama read out of Dr. Seuss until this last week? So we meet today being called into remembrance that Jesus calls us into communion with him and his followers and that as he promised, he will be coming back soon. Remember and ponder some of these points that I would like to share with you. First of all, there will be a rapture. There will be a catching up of the church, the body of Christ. The weatherman says a storm is coming and we all run to Publix to buy toilet paper. <laughs> the preacher stands behind the pulpit and says Jesus is coming. And we yawn. First Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant. Today's language stupid. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, those that have died, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This is not Paul's opinion. He's saying this by word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord is that day of the rapture shall not prevent them which are dead, those that have died in Christ. For the Lord himself sh shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort, that is, give strength one another with these words. And don't worry about if your loved one died before you and the rapture comes while you're living. The Bible tells us that the difference between those that are dead in Christ rising and those of us that remain will be the twinkling of an eye. 
scientifically, that's about one one hundredth of a second. So if you're here through the rapture, you'll be followed as a minister, as a Christian, to be given to visions or to dreams. I, I, I don't discount them. For those that have them, I somewhat have a little bit of jealousy and a little bit of envy. I sometimes wish that God would just give me a big sign or give me a big vision or just give me a dream that would just give me 10 times the amount of energy. But I'm just not given to that, and I justify it by saying, Rick, I don't need to do that to you. There are those that I, I need to do that to, but for you, I don't need to. But I had kind of an occasion like that yesterday morning, Saturday morning. Uh, this is the third time that I've rewritten this sermon. I went out on the porch with, without my sermon. There was just my dog and my second cup of coffee. Uh, our porch outside of our second story bedroom faces direct east. If you will remember, yesterday morning was kind of a uh, cloudy, overcast, dismal morning. And uh, I was thinking about the sermon and thinking about, oh gosh, now I have to go back in there and it's going to take me another hour, hour and a half to recompose and change and make sure that everything's in sequence and that I'm saying everything that I think God wants me to say and looked up. And all of a sudden, those clouds just barely opened up. I had no regrets. And I was ready. I was ready to listening. Are you ready? The rapture of the church is going to happen. <laughs> the scriptures hold sufficient the scriptures hold sufficient evidence that we will recognize loved ones that made it. But in that there is no sin, we will not miss those who are not there. Secondly, we need to prepare for what I mentioned before earlier in my message. We need to prepare for that last communion in heaven, in paradise, the great marriage feast. Jesus and his servants are now setting up the dining room just as we have set up a small table here as you have set up a small table in your homes. Maybe not as elegant as the ones going to be in heaven, but a representation of the table of all tables. Nothing but the best, the best linen, the best tablecloths, pure silver eatery, fine china and crystal, Maybe not literally, but that's the best human way that I can explain it. The supper is one that will prepare us for the millennium of 1,000 years. We will return to earth, and there we will rule this earth, this earth as God intended it to be for 1,000 years. In that 1,000 years, Satan will be bound up in hell. Revelation, the 19th chapter, verses 6 through 10. And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings. This is John trying to explain in human terms what his ears and his eyes were seeing. Saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice. John's hearing this. It's being told to him. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Jesus and the church is the bride. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. That's why we have our Bride's dress in white. For the fine linen 
and it gives us an illustration. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints, and he saith unto me, Write. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper, supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And look and listen what John did. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said, Whoa, don't kneel in front of me. I'm one of the guys just like you. I'm just a fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, that is truth. The new Jerusalem will be instituted. In Revelation 21, 7, 12, and 13, it says this, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. 21, 12, and 13 says, And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and the names were written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. Thirdly and finally, today, through communion, is the time to prepare and remember the promises of Christ, his instructions, and most of all, his holiness. I don't pretend to understand all the mysteries of God. But I'll tell you what I do know, and I am betting my eternal life on it, that Jesus is returning soon and very soon, and we need to be ready. The events will happen just as quick as they did Saturday morning, yesterday morning. I'll be sitting there, and by the way, I was still in my pajamas, <laughs> sitting there and looking up and seeing the sky open. And there won't be time to make a telephone call. There won't be a time to say goodbye. There won't be a time for me to review my theology. There won't be a time to go back and look at all my sermons to see if I've done what's right. It'll just be time to go. Now. The marriage feast is being made ready and make sure you have oil in your spiritual lamp. The story is told to us by Jesus himself in the 25th chapter of, of Matthew about the great marriage feast that we need to be in preparation for. He uses the symbolism of a lamp and of oil. The lamp is, of course, our works, our goodness, and even miracles that we create. And the oil is believing on the blood that only Jesus saves us. I know we're going to run five minutes over time. But better spend the five minutes now getting ready for heaven than five minutes spending eternal in hell. Listen to this story, and, and I could paraphrase it, but Jesus does it so much better than I can. Then the kingdom of heaven is like this. Be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil, oil in them. What did they take? They took their good works. They took their own human character. They took their own faith. They took their own confidence in their belief. They took their own academia, intelligence. But the wise took oil in their vessels with the lamps. They took the blood of the lamb. They took oil, the life-giving substance that God gives us through the blood. They took that with their good works. While the bridegroom tarried, boy, I tell you what, I've, I've had some weddings that I was sweating bullets to, if the groom was going to show up. I've even had one or two shotgun weddings, and those were not nice weddings. 
but everybody's always waiting to make sure that the groom's going to be there. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. That was really a late guy, wasn't it? And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, all ten of them, and trimmed their lamps, turned on their LED flashlights. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, We shall not throw pearls at swine's feet. They didn't say that, but <laughs> Jesus said that in another place. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you. You cannot share your salvation, friends. You can't get to heaven on grandma's religion. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. You go find somebody that will give you some oil. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. We got some oil. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, Oh, this is, this, is, this is the worst thing that the Bible can say. I know you not. I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Remember, remember for us to know and to be married to Christ, we must repent of our sins. I'm not talking about if you would say, well, I'm a good guy, took care of my family, had a good job, was a member of the Kiwanis or the Civitans. It's not what we're talking about. We are born into sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And no, there is not one righteous among you. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. You can be the best person to walk in the face of the earth, but you're guilty of sin until you repent. Until you take that blood of the Lamb and you spread it across the doors of your heart. Then and only then can you be protected. So this day in your homes, and I am honored and privileged to be in your homes, so I don't take that lightly. Unlike the people here, you can turn me off any second. But I invite you to the holy table. May God bless this time of holy communion. I think we have consecrated our elements. We have consecrated our elements. Let us pray. God, for this opportunity to be reminded of our communion with you, we give you thanks. We ask now for those that maybe have put off the decision of accepting Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, to be the only acceptable sacrifice, that they may be able to do it right now and pray that prayer, Oh God, please accept me in your Son's name. And now we ask for these elements to be consecrated. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. At home, if you will now uh, have your uh, cup of juice or whatever and your little piece of bread, uh, we're going to share it with our small congregation. And then if you will hold on to it until we can all take it at the same time, uh, wherever you are in your home, and then we will uh, take it together here in the local church.
now here and uh, for those of you at home, if you will now, now take your juice and drink. And as we eat and as we drink, let us remember that it was his blood that sanctifies, that consecrates, that saves us for that last supper, that marriage feast in heaven. Amen. Now as Almighty God sits at the throne of heaven through the grace of his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with us now and forevermore. Give my people which are called 